So hello everyone, welcome to the discussion. We're going to talk about um, the art of writing, publishing a peer review journal articles. Now it's all, it's, it's very challenging for all of us, but it's also important not only for academia, but also for policies. So it's targeting the people that who are starting to write uh, their first paper or will be writing in future, and maybe have written one or two papers, but it's also maybe useful for others, but basically for early career authors. So before I start my story, I just want to share one thing is that, you know, each and um, different people have a different style, different discipline have a different style of writing. Um, also different journals have slightly different uh, format and their, you know, choice and thinking and thoughts of school. So. Um, it's not to give an idea of specific journals or anything else. It's just telling our stories. Um, maybe it's useful for your work. Great, please. Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody, and, and thank you, Sawa, for the for the invite, and good to see you too. Um, yep, my name is Gregory Cooper. I'm a postdoctorate research fellow at the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, SOAS, at the University of London, um, and I'm in the Centre for... Uh, Centre for Development, Environment and Policy set up. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Southampton. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, hi everyone. I'm University of Bern in Switzerland. Um, I'm also a Marie Curie uh, fellow. Um, it's, it's also it's, the initiative is also part of this Marie Curie um, individual fellowship uh, project success. So you can have a look more information about each of us and about the projects in the, in the description box. So let's talk about um, each of our story, how you write um, your paper. So Greg is happy to volunteer first and to tell his story publishing paper from um, science of the total empowerment to nature communications. Thank you, Greg. Sure. Um, well, thank you again, Sawa. Yeah, just to, just to say, really to start off and say that um, my kind of publishing record so far has been uh, two first authored papers and uh, two kind of co-authored papers where I wasn't the lead author. But I still feel very much kind of at the start of my, my publishing career. Um, and many of these questions and topics we're going to be talking about uh, over the next hour or so you know, are, are super relevant to, you know, the the problems that I face and the kind of things that I consider when, when I'm writing my manuscripts currently. Um, so just a little bit about how I perhaps would go about starting the whole process of, of writing papers. You know, it is a complex, challenging, um, you know, process and arguably kind of the pinnacle of our, of our careers and, and why we're in research, you know, being able to communicate our research effectively and um, everything from our rationale to our methods to our results and the key takeaways. Um, but, but but really, um, that engagement in the literature to start with um, is, is really, for me, the first real step of, of formulating a paper. And and also before really getting writing, I would I would have a think about you know, where you would want to, to publish, maybe have you know, two or three journals on kind of a short list and really spending some time looking at the guidance for authors. Um, you know, journals, they, pub, you know, they, they make available sometimes very in specific instructions about what they are looking to publish, whether it be the um, kind of background or the, the concepts they look to publish, right down to the, to the very, you know, the, um, the formats for the abstracts and the lengths of the manuscripts and so on. So starting to understand the types of kind of structure and framework you may have to write your manuscript around for your target uh, journal can can be can be useful. Uh, straight away you can start to think, okay, I only have a four thousand word limit in the case of you know, uh, some you know some some journals, say Nature and Science, for example, relatively short, all the way to 
some more kind of development focused journals which may have 10,000 word, word limits. Um, so these, these are just some of the, the things that I would go through before really starting to write. So one of the ways we can, we can organize uh, literature uh, is using this kind of framework of an inverse triangle and you, you could start by organizing some of the literature, some of the broadest kind of global scale um, studies uh, and then starting to work down kind of methodologically, um, systematically down towards studies which um, are particularly focused on your case study or your region and just using this as a way to guide the reader or guide the reviewer through you know broad global scale challenges down to regional frameworks or particular applications of particular frameworks down to the, the specific problem presented by your case study. And that can then lead into a way of um, presenting your research questions or presenting your, you know, your problem statements. That's just one way that I, I tend to organize um, literature in a literature review or an introduction. I've, I've just got here a few challenges of, um, of writing an introduction. The first one would be a word count and you know, I think we probably all have tended to overwrite uh, introductions, at least in our first drafts, where we want to try and cover as many bases as possible, show that we are engaged with the literature. Um, and I, I think that is natu natural to, to do that. I, I guess a couple of key things here here is that you can always go back and redraft and, and once you are confident that you have covered all the bases, <clears throat> having the confidence to then, you know, make changes and make edits will come naturally and, and the second would be also just to be open and, and kind of encourage collaboration with your co-authors as much as possible and as early as possible you know our research papers sometimes feel like our you know our babies you know we, we don't want to share them we're perhaps a little bit nervous about um criticism or or different edits and so on but really sharing our work with our co-authors as early as possible and, and encouraging them to to interact and engage constructively is a good way also to build confidence that you know, the type of literature you're talking about, the type of research questions you have identified are you know, important and, and will add something to the literature. So once you have, I think another key point is in any kind of writing, we always fight, face kind of writer's block. And I would just encourage, you know, just, just you know, to, to early career researchers, in my experience anyway, just to kind of go for it. Get that first draft in, into the kind of inbox of your supervisors um, and and they will tell you, you know, if it's you know, right or wrong, but they will they will help in, to shape the paper and to, you know, to to really turn it into something that is, you know, ready to be published. Um, so that is kind of a, a key point that we as early career researchers, you know, we have we have done some great work, perhaps, and we shouldn't be afraid to, to really write and, and express our, our thoughts. So for me, the methodology, which often, you know, often comes out in introduction, probably is, is one of the most challenging sections. Um, a lot of the work I do is, is based on modeling, systems dynamics modeling, um, so I think it's dynamic simulation technique with scenarios and parameter values and so on. Um, and it is a challenge to how do we effectively communicate our methods within the word count to a sufficient level of detail, which, you know, balances the broad kind of overview of the methods for people who are more interested in our results, but also satisfies people who are interested in the real um, details of, of, of the underlying assumptions and parameter values of the model. Um, so just a, a couple of tips here perhaps and and, and things that i think about when, when writing a methods um always I, I would suggest always have a look whether the journal supports a technical appendix or, or a supplementary information um these can often be good places to you know really detail some of the some of the you know the extra analysis or the ex extra data sets which perhaps you may not be able to fit into the main manuscript. So, and, and quite often now, many journals are quite inventive. They might even allow, you know, videos or, you know, um, many different diagram formats and so on to communicate your, your methods. Um, 
so so I, I would suggest you know as you go through making your short lists of journals have a look at the appendices have a look at the, for the availability of the appendices um, do they support allowing you to to uh, write about your methods in there um, but, and sorry so on. to interrupt, Greg. Um, just Please. one quick question. You know, um, mm. though there is the appendix, but you know, for for example, your modeling perspective, there is a lot of things going on, like limitations, the mm. building, the parameterizations, the the running of yep. the model, the scenario. So, how do you make really like a very easily readable to the non-modeling expert people? within that yeah. very small section within that word limit how do you overcome overcome those challenge yeah great great question so uh, i think i think one of the, the keys is is when you, what i do anyway and it, by, by no means the right way but at the start of the methodology i would always provide an overview to the methods whether it be a 200 300 words saying you know almost like an abstract to the methodology we you know, we um, created a model using these data sets to do X and Y under these scenarios. And we are going to talk you through how we how we did this. It's kind of a way to signpost, um, you know, the overarching methods that are involved and the data sets that we collected and so on. It then becomes a question of, yeah, how much detail we want to we want to give in, in, in the methods. Um, First of all, is, is is where possible the use of of diagrams. You know, many people are visual learners, and whether that could be in systems dynamics using causal loop diagrams, for example, or stop and flow diagrams to visualize the types of feedbacks that are involved. That that's one way trying to diversify the way you communicate your methodology. Um, I would then always try and flag in the methods where you provide more detail elsewhere whether that could be in a previous paper you may have published or the appendix um and, and really trying to be as open and honest about the level of detail you are are giving and you know if for example you are only going to describe the key feedbacks in the model make sure you you state that and perhaps provide a signpost to where uh, the readers can find details about the equations, for example, which inform those, those feedbacks. Um, there is, a, as, as you rightly point out, Sawa, there is a, a, a real balance to strike and it's, it's not always easy. Um, and, and again, perhaps you, you will end up overwriting the methodology. Um, I think a recent manuscript I submitted, I originally had the description of the model around 2000 words. And you know, my supervisor, who is not a modeler, you know, he, he had told me, you know, you have to cut this down. You know, people will be bored and lost by the, you know, after a thousand words here. So you, you then, you know, start to realize, okay, I'm giving too much detail here. Um, this could be better placed in an appendix or in a, in an archive somewhere. So it is also an iterative process and it's very difficult to get it right the first time. Um, also just the last bit of methods, perhaps. Um, just looking, it's also important to think about and trying to communicate validation of, of your of your methodology. Um, being able to show that uh, whether it be a model or a statistical mo you know, statistical model or regression that your methods perform well under different uncertainty ranges and different starting assumptions and initial conditions. Being able to show that. You know, we'll, we'll build confidence in in your methodology. Um, so, so space should be, if if that is relevant to you, space should be reserved within your methods. Um, or it could be the start, perhaps, of your your results to show that your your methods are doing what you would would like to, and that they stand up to, um, you know, they are robust and they stand up to statistical uncertainties. That's another thing just to, just to think about um, before we start to go into the results. So, if it's okay, by all means, you can ask ask questions and so on on anything that I've said. But um, going on to the results, really, um, kind of a, a, an evergreen question is, you know, do we want to discuss our results in the results section? What level of detail do we go into? Do we discuss policy implications and so on? And you know, there are discipline 
there are differences between disciplines here. Um, coming out of the ge geography department at the University of Southampton, you know, multiple times my, my supervisor would tell me that you know we shouldn't be discussing results at all in sorry yeah discussing results at all in the results section, um, and that is you know the implications for uh, decision makers and policy makers and the uncertainties um, or the limitations of our methods are, are reserved for. Um, for the discussion section. But going into kind of the agricultural economics field, um, it is generally more acceptable to, to you know, discuss the implications of our results in, in, in those sections. And one way to, to think about that or, or to find out about that would be spending time reading the literature from a journal where you, know, where you plan to, to submit and where you plan to publish and, and helping that you know, helping those papers guide you with the balance around simply, you know, stating the headline results and how they relate to your research questions relative to starting to draw out some of the deeper implications. So again, just spending time you know, with the journals and in the literature and help, there, you know, there is no right or wrong way, but allowing the previously published literature to, to guide, to guide you there. But do you have um, any, any, any like pre-structure in your mind that you try to structure your results like uh, based on research questions or the sub research questions or maybe according to the methods or according to the the conceptual framework i mean do you have any kind of you know like a strategy that the mm. maybe the early career authors they can try to think about sure. it yeah certainly it's, it's just my experience and you know it's by no means universal but um for me, I, I try to answer my research questions and whether that it is in separate subsections, but really is trying to flag the key headlines you know, to, to the research questions which I set out earlier on you know, at the end of the introduction or wherever. Um, that is the way I have tended to do it in so far. And perhaps they may then blend into each other, the sections. If there are common themes between the sections, then perhaps that, that um, boundary becomes a little bit you know, more fuzzy. But in general, to start with, I try and answer my research questions. Um, that, that's my strategy, and it may change over time if I write different types of papers, such as a literature review or, or something like that. Um, but, but that is my strategy, and I accept other people may do, do things differently. Um, so just going on to the discussion, and all means we can come back. Uh, again, for, for me, the discussion is often iterative. It often starts quite long and we often, or I often at least try and almost criticize my work too much. And then my supervisor will say, Greg, why have you, you know, why have you said this? You've already shown that your model, you know, is valid under these, you know, under these conditions and so on. So often the discussion does seem at least to start with, you know, very long that you're overwriting it. But again, just, just stressing the importance of, of sharing it with your co-authors and, and working on it, you know, over a number of drafts, um, really just to help shape the discussion. And people who have much more experience than me and then my co-authors, they will help to say, you know, great, this should be moved up into the results section or this should be reserved for the, the conclusion. Um, but also you want to discuss the, you know, we think about the limits of our work you know, often. We want to discuss them in a, in a, in a transparent way and, and you know, think about how alternative methods or some of the weaknesses of our methods may impact the implications of our, of our results and the answering of our research question. Um, and really also thinking about the unanswered questions um, which, haven't, you know, which haven't been answered by our research. Is there, you know, is there, are there data shortages? Are there you know, opportunities for collecting more data or revising models in certain ways? Um, were there logistical, practical barriers to to certain data collection and so on? Um, and just being open about this and and you know, holding your hand up and saying that you know my my research has been able to answer these following questions. But there are there are still some unanswered questions which we you know would hope to answer in future and so on. Um, in terms of abstract, I, I, I mean, I always 
to, to begin with, I always wanted to write my abstract first. You know, it comes at the start of the manuscript. I've now started to you know, always kind of uh, write the abstracts as a, as a draft or a very, very kind of scratchy draft to begin with, but really only come back to it at the end um, as a way to to organize, yeah, to check you know, how well you have organized your manuscript and that you've answered your, your key questions. Um, and again, the abstract takes work. You know, it, there, there is no very limited chances of writing a perfect abstract straight away. Um, and it's iterative and, you know, what, again, just checking the, what the journal requires. Does it require a 300 word abstract or does it require a 150 word abstract? Are you allowed references and so on? Um, you know, these are important, important factors to check as again, as you plan to where you want to submit and, and how you want to write the manuscript. And finally, for me, um, at least for now, uh, going about just uh, choosing a, a journal, how we, how we go about selecting somewhere to submit, a, a good way is often looking at the literature you are, you are writing about and, and are citing. Um, as you, you, you know that you are writing about literature that is relevant to that field, um, and, and having a look at your reference list, your reference lists, and helping that guide where you may want to to submit. Speaking with with your colleagues and your supervisors um, you know, who have more experience than you, who have experience of submitting to certain journals and uh, dealing with reviewers and so on. So again, it's that collaboration process really helps to to inform you know, my opinion. And also having a look at the uh, the, the board of editors. Um, understanding what are their expertise uh, may they expect to, to be submitted and just using these I mean I'm sure you guys have other you know, other ideas as well but these are the ways I would come up with a, a short list at least of, of articles um, and then working with your team to to refine those and, and come up with where you want to submit first yeah okay thanks Greg that's that's very useful okay. you know um, that's a, a very useful experience that you had maybe we can come back some of the questions of course that we receive from the participants and may answer also very specific questions uh, that that how you actually overcome uh, the challenges while writing paper so okay so in terms of the introduction um, I just want to mention uh, three points one when I'm writing introduction, uh, Greg was mentioning that triangular shape, which I actually call the funnel shape. So the, the big funnel on the top. So I try to take a broader view of the at a global scale. Yeah, the problem, the background, the motivation. And then I try to narrow down that problem, that motivation to local scale, because, you know, often you get criticized when you submit a paper to the journal that this paper may be suitable for um, local, regional, and national journals. Why? Because we often lack of linking our studies or research to the global importance. So it's important, that's why I take that funnel shape you know, approach that I start with global um, uh, background, then narrow down to local, national, regional scale. And also about the research gap, I really think it's important. Why? Because, you know, people often try to say, oh, there was a little or few research has been done and then try to escape it. I would, I, I personally, I don't try to escape it, but I try to elaborate and what has been done actually and what are the existing gaps and which gaps specifically I'm trying to fill. But I don't restrict myself just to, you know, identifying the gaps or mentioning the state in the gaps, but I also explain why filling these gaps is important or are important. It's also in terms of maybe national policies or to global policies. Maybe you have used innovative methods no one has used. Maybe the concept or maybe the knowledge that you are generating. So you have to be specific what types of contribution that you are adding, what types of research gaps that you are filling, 
also maybe some of the global policies like SDGs or the climate um, um, agreement. So you, you become, you know, it's, it's your selling point. Because why people want to listen your story if it's not important to the wider audience? For example, um, if I'm saying the mangrove forest in Bangladesh, why the, the whole world, uh, um, I mean, should be listening to the mangrove story coming from a local um, uh, local place or the like, like very small place. So you have to link your theory, concepts, all the methods with uh, like a you know broader policy implications that that it's, it's really your selling point the third the last one in the introduction when i feel that when you were mentioning your aim or objective of your paper please try to develop three four research questions or sub objective because that really helps also in your method section result section also in your discussion because Sylvia was mentioning the conceptual framework so it's really relate back to 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 your different section that you can really structure so I know the formula formulating research question is very challenging or the sub objectives but personally I do it first before I really started to work in a project or in a paper um, in terms of the methods I really focus on three things, what, why, and how. What has been used, why this method has been used, and how. For example, if, I, if I'm just saying the focus group discussion has been used to answer the research question one, then how you have done that focus group discussion is very important. Who are the people, why you have chosen those people, so you have to tell how. So it's also for other methods, you need to you know, tell that how you have done it. So you don't have to write too many things, but telling the main point of this why, what, why, and how. But importantly, because when I think, oh, sorry, when I review some of the papers, I found people to try to say, the focus on the methods in the method section what i do personally is i focused on the conceptual framework or the research questions focusing the methods that which methods has been used to answer which research question or the sub objectives or the you know the the using that conceptual framework so it's it's more focused on your research questions rather than your methods the in terms of the, the discussion, I really prefer, I, I really write, not prefer, I really write two separate section results and discussion. Um, in the discussion section, I really focus on the, at the beginning, the summary of my results because I really put the numbers in the results section explaining the carbs, important, significant or in terms of the result, uh, research questions, try to answer the, the different data, the different figures, or different tables in terms of numbers. But, you know, if someone is not expert in your field, but he's not an academic, and he doesn't possibly, he doesn't have time for, for example, policymakers, what he or she should, she should understand from the results, all these numbers, temperature has changed from two degree to five degrees Celsius within this time period. So after writing that numbers, I focus on the discussion section, trying to make very clear and summarized answer in a simple way for a very general readers. Maybe it's, it's kind of easy way that you're trying to answer the research questions that if someone is understand non-expert, a general reader, is reading they can easily interpret what is the results or the findings of my research then after that i try to explain the differences or the similarities with the previous research but not that much because then i don't want to make it like a read like a literature review because that's how I different, uh, differentiate between introduction and discussion. And then 
most important part, I think, which is very challenging because it took me a um, while to write discussion. Still, I'm facing that challenge, but I really write the policy implication part. Because, for example, I'm, if I'm saying there's a three degree Celsius temperature increase in Ganges Delta, meaning what? Exactly, because meaning what? Or there is a reduction of poverty of 20%, meaning what? What does it mean for the policies in terms of, you know, um, maybe national level or the regional level or maybe the global scale SDGs or different, any other policy? So you need to link with this, with this, you know, the, the different policies that what does it mean your findings for the policies? Because this is how I try to make a section that is policy implications. In, in, in the third section that you already mentioned the limitations. So it's, it's I pre try to prefer or I write like, you know, the, what was what were the limitations and how I try to overcome it. And also that maybe there's some limitations, you know, not putting my risking my paper or my work. But there should be some limitation for the future work because that's for the future work that I try to mention at the end of the paper. But then how this these findings can be useful, like I try to write at least three, four lines, how my findings can be useful either for policy or for the academic people. In terms of the abstract, when I'm writing the abstract, the first line always I write is, you know, the summary of the background of the research. The first line. And then I try to put another line saying the research, the gaps, you know, the motivation and the research gaps. And then definitely the, the methods, how I have used the methods to answer that research gaps. And then maybe three, four lines to to the very key findings, very key finding, because this abstract is very important because when you're submitting the journal, um, I think the first thing that the editor is going to read is abstract. So it's, it's, it's very careful. I always write at the end. So I write the introduction first, methods, results, discussion, conclusion, and then I go back to abstract. So this is how actually I, I, I write my whole paper, but there will be, I will be giving answer to the several questions. And then I think trying to, then you can get more um, information about uh, the papers. That, that's why I don't want to you can make it lengthy. So thank you uh, again. Maybe we can go to the question section and go to the each of the uh, question and um, try to answer. Uh, give our each of our perspective.